part two of interview with Joseph Perkins, August 21st, August 24th, 2011. So Joe, um, I know that when you left Vietnam and you got out of the Marine Corps, that was not the end of your military experience. Can you tell me how you joined the Army? When I first got out of the Marine Corps, uh, you, they, I, they told me I had uh, an obligation to do a total of six years, so they wanted me to join the uh, active reserve. Well, I looked around Connecticut, and at that time they only had a truck company in New Haven, and they had a, a headquarters company in Hartford. And uh, I said, well, what's the chances of me ever getting promoted there? What kind of a future would I have there? So. Had you left the Marine Corps as a sergeant? Yes. Yep. Um, was, I did. I completed my. Back then, you had to do six years of service. One part of it could be active duty. The other part could be inactive duty. Well, of course, the Marine Corps, like everybody else, wanted to recruit and they wanted to have you on an active status if they could. If not, then they wanted to get you into reserve status. So that was the truck company here in Connecticut. Since then, they've had they've got an infantry company up in Plainfield. But anyway, uh, I looked at that, and I, I was a, a new state trooper. I was learning there, and I was getting ready to go to school, and I felt as though that was enough on my plate. I didn't, wasn't going to go anywhere anyway, so hey, I've had enough of the military. As time went on, I always had the love for the military. Always did, still do today. Um, but one day, and I don't know, about 1974, a, a trooper friend of mine who had been in the uh, Connecticut Army National Guard for years told me, he said, hey, there's a good opportunity in the Guard. You can go all the way up to general if you, if you choose to, and you get in the right places, do the right job and the good job. And he said, with your background, having a degree, you can easily be commissioned and have a good career. I kind of scoffed that off for a bit because I was really working hard at, at trying to get through school and work at the same time. But uh, I talked to my wife about it, and she the first question that she asked was, will you go back overseas? And my answer was no, I don't think so. Uh, I said, actually, probably not. There was no draft or anything. Everything is a volunteer army now. So make a long story short, I joined, and uh, when I did, because of my, my education and everything, I was given about, uh, a, a commission. So this was the Army National Guard? Army, Connecticut Army National Guard. How did you feel about leaving the Marines? See, I have a, probably a different outlook on jobs than most people do. And the philosophy is simple. The Marine Corps, I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. It has something that no other service has. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. No other service, no matter what they say, no matter what they try to pretend, can never create that mystique that Marines have. That when they say Semper Fidelis, that is a friendship. Why? It's a small organization, but it's got a lot of pride, and they believe in it. What other service has that? They try to have it, but they don't have it. So that was a great experience. But it was time in my life to move on now. I ended up with a great job as a Connecticut State Trooper. Couldn't have picked a better job. Uh, did real well, had a great career. My, most of my time was spent in major crimes. I investigated homicides. It's the elite of the state police. Did that for eight years. I ran the major crime squad in the Eastern District. When I was tired of looking for that proverbial uh, needle in the haystack, I asked the commissioner if I could go to aviation, because I was a pilot. And he said, I'd think about it. About a week later, I got my orders. I got transferred to the aviation department. Six o'clock in the morning, I'm up at 2,500 feet flying around the state or on a mission. And I'm saying to myself, I'm getting paid to do something that I love, fly an aircraft every day. Well, how did you get into aviation? How did I get in aviation? When I was a kid, I always loved and wanted to fly. Now. I, in uh, probably in 1980 or 81, uh, we the family, my two sons and my wife and I, went to uh, Disney World. 
And on that, we took a side trip to uh, the space shuttle to see uh, NASA. And uh, I'm looking at all these things, and I picked up a book from Cessna on flight schools and what you can do. And I was looking at it, and I said, look at this. So there's um, a flight school right in Groton, New London Airport. So she said, well, why don't you look into it when you get home? So I did. I went to flight school. Oh, so you went as a civilian. You yep. didn't learn that in no. the military. No, because I didn't have the MOS or anything like that. Different story in the military. What year did you join the Army National Guard? 1975. And I was commissioned a captain. So when you were flying, you weren't flying for the National Guard. You were flying. I was flying for the Connecticut State Police. Oh. Yep. When you joined the National Guard in '75, what were your duties and what were your what was your commitment? What did you have to be responsible for? I, you, well, when you're a commissioned officer, you don't sign up for four years or anything. You sign up and then if you want to get out, after, if, if you're not obligated to do a certain amount of time, in which I was not, I could get out a year later if I wanted to because I've already served my time. My mandatory requirement was done. So now any time I spent, it was on my time. So uh, as an officer, I was indefinite for one thing. On my ID card, it's indefinite. And um, I was assigned to the 43rd uh, Infantry Brigade here in Connecticut. And in that, in that group is the 1st and 102nd Infantry, which has a long lineage in Connecticut history. It's headquartered in New Haven. And I joined the staff there as the uh, S4. Shortly after that, I was made a, com a company commander in Meriden, and then quickly my career, I went back to the brigade as the brigade training officer, the S3, for three years. Went back to the 1st and 102nd Infantry as the new battalion commander for three years. Then was commander of the 1st to the 102nd, 2nd to the 102nd Infantry, the sister battalion to it, for one year. And unfortunately, I had the dubious position of closing that battalion down. We folded the flag because the Army was downsizing in the early 90s. So what year was that? 1991. At that time, the National Guard had two major headquarters. They had the brigade, the infantry brigade. We were a brigade, part of the 26th Yankee Division, located in Boston, Massachusetts which is made up of three different brigades, plus an artillery brigade and a COSCOM, which is a support group, huge division. Um, but they started taking that apart too, and they determined they didn't need the 26th anymore. So the, um, it was called Quicksilver. Quicksilver was the reduction of manpower in the Army back in the early, early 90s. I, at that time, was a lieutenant colonel. And I can remember sitting up in Hartford at the headquarters armory and thinking to another good friend of mine, Louis Preziosi, and saying, geez, Lou, we're probably going to, and we already had our 20 years in now. We have done 20 years. So you can retire any time after that. So we didn't have anywhere to go. We, the other headquarters was what we call Stark. That group was down in headquartered in New London, and that took care of all of the battalions other than the brigade. That was the aviation and all of those groups. And uh, we said, we're probably out. So the next morning, this was a Saturday, I was talking to Louie about it, and on Sunday morning, I come into the armory, and I'm about 15 minutes late. Uh, and a young lady at the, foot, at the top of the stairs said, sir, the chief of staff would like to see you. I said to myself, you got to be kidding me. I looked at my watch, 15 minutes late, and he's going to hang me for that and then tell me I'm out of the guard all at once. I went up the stairs, went in and saw the chief of staff, and he told me that um, I was being transferred. I said, transferred? 
He said, yeah, you're going down as the XO of the 85th Troop Command. That hadn't been done in the past. Never to the two cross. You know, in other words, if you were in the brigade, the, the infantry, you stayed there for your career, different spots. I had already done four years as a battalion commander, two and a half years as a company commander, and three years as the brigade training officer, the S3. So now I'm down here as the XO to the 85th Troop Command. And where was that located? That's New London. The Army there in New London. The commander told me uh, that he needed help. I do a good job. More than likely, I'd be the commander within a year, or at least a year. Uh, a year to the day later, I got promoted to 06. And I became the Troop Command Commander. I was supposed to be there for three years. At the end of, just about the end of my first year, the Chief of Staff, through the Adjutant General, asked me if I would take over the off, off, training the OCS, Officer Candidate School, and the NCO School at Camp, then I think it would have been, I don't know, one of the governor's names at the time. Um, and I did. I said, yeah, I'd do that, and, I'd trans and, and he wanted me to transition to the new Army training schools. The Army back then had 54 schools throughout the world, 54 different schools. They were reorganizing into seven schools, into seven regions. I would be part of the A region, which is New England states. I transitioned over to the new. As a matter of fact, as we speak on September 9th, as we have stand down here, they're dedicating a new $31 million training school at Camp Niantic as I was the first commander that started that process. And um, we got, I was in command of all troops for training, all the New England states, New York and New Jersey. And all of those were under my command for three, almost four years. From there, uh, that picture is me getting relieved, doing a change of command. And I was going to Stark to do nothing until I retired, because I've now I've already had a major command. I've actually I've had two major commands. I don't know, maybe a month later I got called in by General Cugno and said I need somebody to take over the 143rd Area Support Group, which is now commanding all troops. And I took that over. Now I'm the, have, I have the distinction of being the only guy that's ever commanded all three of the major commands in the state of Connecticut. The only guy. Lucky, you're very lucky if you even get one. And I had all three of them. So I ended up with, in my career, in the guard of uh, making Brigadier General, one star, and I commanded all three of the MACOM commands in the state with little over 15 years of command time. The average officer in the Connecticut National Guard, if he's lucky, gets maybe with company command and a year as a battalion commander, and one out of 10 might be a year or 18 months as, a, as the regimental commander, he might get four years. I have over 15 years. How many years total were you in the Army National Guard? 28 years, five months, and the rest of the Marine Corps. I have a total of 34 years and five months of credited time. Now, Joe, how, how does this overlap with your state police job? How could you be doing all this stuff? Or were, were they at the same time? Or was it after you left state police? No. In 1975, I was considered still a rookie. I joined the state police in, in 68, 75. I was still a rookie. State of Connecticut. Obviously, the state police is a, a major unit in the state of Connecticut. The Connecticut National Guard is still. My boss was the same guy, okay, the governor. The top guy was the same guy. The governors of the state of Connecticut traditionally are called the state's captain general. So they play a role in that. And the governors like O'Neill, Dempsey, those gentlemen, they supported the guard. If I had the t I was given the time, like everybody else that wanted to do it, do a weekend. They bent over backwards to give you a weekend. They bent over backwards to give you your school time. They bent over, I'm talking about military education. And I'll tell you about that in a second. They bent over backwards to make sure you go to your annual trainings. Now, 
I have a, what I consider a very good education on the civilian side. You know, everybody traditionally high school, college, graduate school. I have that. Now in the military, I got my commission. I went to officer's basic school, officer's advanced course, then the command and general staff college, which is a three-year program. And then I had the distinction of being one of the 2% in the entire country, full-time army and National Guard. I got selected to go to the Army War College. So that was the pinnacle for my career at Carlisle Barracks to get picked, and I'm a graduate of the class of 1998 from the Army War College. Very, very prestigious, very proud of that. And then five years later, I retired as, at mandatory age of 60. So how did I feel about that? Simple. It's the same thing when I had the age and the time was right to leave the best job I ever had, meaning the Connecticut State Police. It's a job. I went to the next job, which was Sikorsky Aircraft, Director of Security. I became their international guy. I traveled all over the world all the time. Had a great career that almost anybody would take and cherish. At the age of 65, I, I walked away because it was a job. And that's what they are. Because when I leave this job now that I'm in, they'll say, Joe Perkins who? <laughs> Just kidding. But that's how it, you have to let it go. Did I want to leave the Army? No. But I knew the, the regulations say, age 60, you have to go. So that's my attitude. I love so, it. And now you're in a different job, but still dealing with the military. What's right. the present job? I'm the deputy commissioner for at the Department of Veterans Affairs for the state of Connecticut. And I'm how a, did that come about? That came about by doing something that I've always wanted to do and never was able to do. Politics. I, I could never be involved in politics as a state trooper. I couldn't be involved in politics in my job at Sikorsky because of my background uh, and my classifications of what I worked with as part of my job. And of course, I couldn't be involved in the military. So I studied that in public administration in school and always had an interest and always really wanted to know. I knew from studying, but I wanted to see firsthand how does the legislature really work? How does it interact? You know, I know we have three of parts of the puzzle for, for government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. I wanted to see how that gels and how it works and what politics really is about. In order to do that, you get involved a little bit, and that's all I did, is get involved a little bit. I got to know the governor uh, real well. I supported him, I liked his ideas. I'll be honest with you today. He said it himself, if I actually do my job, and balance this budget and get the state on the road to recovery, I won't be reelected. But he said, that's what they elected me to do, and that's what I intend to do. So I have a lot of respect for that. Whether I agree with all of his policies, maybe and maybe not in some of it. But I got to know him, I did an interview, and here I am. And now I'm learning about the uh, small intricacy parts of state government, which is good which is good. I've, I'll be here for four years, as long as I do the job, and he wants me to be here, and, the, and, the, and, and our commissioner. That's my life in a nutshell. Well, it's pretty extensive. Joe, how would you say your military service affected your life? You know, the, the National Guard and stuff, I actually learned it, the basics I actually learned responsibility. I actually learned leadership tact, uh, tactics. I actually learned um, how to deal with people, interact with people in the Marine Corps. Th there's a lot of things that, you know, you hear about the Marine Corps. There's a lot of things that they say is tough, but you only get out of it what you put into it. And I learned, I, I looked, I listened, and you gotta have the right temperament. And the reason I was successful with my commands is because I listen to people, I treat people the way I'd like to be treated, and I care about people. And that's probably why I was led into this job 
because it's caring about veterans. And what better can a guy do as a past commander is to try to take care of some of the guys that are in need. They say it's an equal world, and maybe it is, but a lot of people will say it's not. They'll say some people have an advantage, other people don't, there are problems. Well, that's what we try to do here. We try to help these guys through their problems. And that's why I like it. Joe, is there anything that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Not really. I think you covered it pretty well. I think you find that uh, my time in, in, in the military overall is great. My time as pulling the trigger in war is minimal. I'll be the first guy to tell you that. Combat veteran, yeah. Uh, how do you describe that? It goes from A to Z. Uh, my time in actual combat was very small, and I'm glad I got out alive, and I'm glad I got out with everything I went in with, and I didn't get any diseases. I took care of myself, and I'm doing fine. I'd like to thank you for this interview, and thank you for your service. Okay.